Ladies and gentlemen, I know it's a sunshiny day. Everybody would prefer, prefer to be outside in a public bath or something like that. But we have a much more exciting program. The, first, uh, the last time I stood here was on the occasion of Paul. My name is Helmut Heidt. And the last time I stood here was on the occasion of um, Paul's 60th birthday. I don't tell you how long that is ago. Um, not that much, not that long. Um, and I found myself in the position opening the ceremony, and it took me about one minute to talk myself into trouble. At least the vice president of the university put his head to Paul and said, der redet sich noch um Kopf und Kragen. Um, so he's talking himself into serious trouble. Um, that's why I brought some <laughs> preparation this time. <laughs> And my, 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 um, the thing I need to do is way more easy this time. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, you to the next speaker, which is Howard Sankey. Um, originally from California, he is professor for philosophy at Melbourne University, so he traveled the longest distance to be with us today, which I very much approve of. Paul Heunigen and Howard Sankey got in contact via some uh, well, how do I put it, um, some shared interest in the notion of incommensurability, which is a quite <laughs> difficult term, obviously, on which Howard had published two seminal books, The Incommensurability Thesis in 1994, and then another book, Rationality, Relativism and Incommensurability in 1997. In addition to numerous articles, he also wrote a defense of um, scientific realism, in, in a study at, um, published in 2008, Scientific Realism and the Rationality of Science. Since these two scholars seem to disagree not only on incommensurability, but also on related methods, such as realism, relativism, inductivism, Kuhn, Feierabend, etc., etc., and since they seem to disagree on all these things, they decided they should work together more closely. Howard visited the Center for Philosophy and Ethics of Science, and they organized um, the already mentioned conference on incommensurability together in 1999. It was Howard's idea, not mine. Even better, though. In spite of their different philosophical intuitions, they are both perfectionists to the detail. I'm sure that Howard would agree with Paul that there is actually a right way to staple. <laughs> As I can tell from, from my own experience, they are both caring and reliable teachers, and they both share, um, it's, it should be diagonal, I believe, um, and they both share the same philosophical and argumentative rigor. To the audiences, it has always been very entertaining and, and illuminating when they put the Paul and Howard show on the stage. However, this is certainly not going to happen today, since um, Howard is speaking about some easy and non-question-begging topics this time. <laughs> His title is Skepticism, Relativism, and Naturalistic Particularism. Howard, I'm very happy to have you here. The stage is yours. I don't stay near it. Um, well, I don't know what time of day it is where I'm from, but it's always nice to get a bit of summer in the middle of winter. Um, and so I'm happy to be up here. Uh, thanks to Helmut and Simon for inviting me. Um, I'm very happy to be back. The last time I stood here was at the opening of Incommensurable Building Related Matters 15 years and three weeks ago. Um, uh, so that's an, an anniversary um, that I can think of. Um, so I'm actually going to say very little about incommensurability um, or something, uh, and little about scientific realism, but I'm a realist, so this is emanating from my realist point of view. Um, now, here's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to present to you just an overview of the approach to epistemic relativism that I've been working on for the last four or five years. Um, now this approach is based on my use of some ideas developed by Roderick Chisholm 
Um, now, Chisholm adopts a view that he calls particularism. I call it epistemic particularism. Now, Chisholm adopts this view in response to a skeptical view. In fact, what I would say is Huronian skepticism. Um, but while I take on board Chisholm's particularism, um, Chisholm is a foundationalist, he's an internalist, he's not a naturalist, and I'm a naturalist and a reliabilist and so forth. So there's not a lot of, there's some differences. I, I, I take on his particularism, but I have some differences with this view. Um, moreover, his approach is designed to respond to the problem of skepticism, and I use it as a response to the problem of relativism. Now, uh, why would I speak about this topic at a symposium um, honoring Paul Hoyning and Hoon's uh, retirement? Um, uh, Paul's not a relativist. Well, we could talk about that. Um, <laughs> he's not a skeptic. We did talk about that. I, if you're a Kantian, you're a skeptic. Um, but uh, what's the relevance of my approach to Paul's work? Well, the answer is that my approach actually has arisen in part out of my interaction with Paul, among other people. Um, so while the view that I'm going to describe to you isn't one that clearly engages with Paul's work, it's a view that I um, uh, came to among other things, by out of my interaction with Paul. So I'm going to describe briefly four ways in which um, this uh, approach of mine connects up with, with um, Paul and with my interaction with Paul. Um, so the first aspect of the, of the approach that connects with Paul's work is his, um, well, first of all, he often doesn't want, to, unless he's changed, doesn't want to say what his philosophical position is. So I simply had to assume that his philosophical position was the one he attributed to Kuhn. Um, uh, he would say it's a good interpretation of Kuhn, it can be defended, but I'm not gonna say what my view is. I, I think I should with, withhold judgment, but I just simply wouldn't buy that. Um, I treat him as defending <laughs> the, the neo-Kantian view, not just as an interpretation, but as that's his philosophical view. Um, but how was I, as a realist, going to respond to this new Kantian challenge? And it's, I struggled with it for a long time. I didn't really know what to do in response. Um, well, the way I've responded is something that, well, Paul's told me this is just not doing philosophy, the, the, the view that I've taken. Um, I've adopted a Morian common sense realist position, right? Um, that basically here's one hand and here's another, and it's true that here's one hand and here's another, and I know that here's one hand and here's another, and there's an external world, which I've just proven the existence of, uh, and it would be implausible to suggest anything else. Now, um, that's not going to persuade Paul, but trying to figure out how to respond to Paul, that's the view that I came to. Um, so that's the first connection between this uh, view and um, my interaction with Paul. The second thing, um, that connects us with Paul is that when I'm thinking about a relativist, um, and in particular for today's purposes, an epistemic relativist, my uh, prime example is Kuhn. Kuhn in the first edition of Structure of Scientific Revolutions, um, and I realize we can have sort of scholarly quibbles about whether this is the right way of thinking about Kuhn, but um, there are elements in Kuhn's view that make him the paradigmatic epistemic relativist that I'm thinking of. I'm not thinking of Rorty, I'm not thinking of Barnes and Bloor, I'm thinking of some things that Kuhn says in uh, the first edition of Structure, and here are the two components. Kuhn has the idea that there are rules of puzzle solving, um, uh, satisfactory puzzle solving, uh, or adequacy of solving of puzzles, which are effectively epistemic standards, I think, um, and they vary from one paradigm to another. So epistemic standards vary from one paradigm to another. And he says, there's no higher standard than the ascent of the relevant community. He doesn't give us any account of the epistemic grounding of these rules other than a sociological one. So I take Kuhn, at least early on, um, as being a paradigmatic example of an epistemic relativist. I, I don't take his later view as so obviously relativistic because he does have um, a set of fixed standards that apply to all paradigms. Um, the problem is, though, that he doesn't have an account of what makes those standards correct. So I'm not, I'm not clear that he avoids relativism in the end. But um, 
that's a connection between my current work and, and the connection with, with Paul, namely that I take Kuhn as a paradigmatic example, a paradigmatic example of epistemic relativism. Now, the third connection is by way of the idea of meta incommensurability. Um, now, uh, Paul and Eric Oberheim and Han Anderson did me the great favor of writing an 11 page critical review of my first book um, in, uh, and it came out Studies in History and Philosophy of Science. And the first time I ever met Paul was in Castiglioncello, Tuscany in, I think, 1996. And he walk, I walked up to introduce myself to him and he said, before we go any further, you should read this. Uh, and so I took it back to my room and, and read it. Uh, and I was actually going to interview him uh, for Metascience, and we went ahead and I met, we had a nice afternoon um, uh, sitting out in the, in the sun in, in, in Italy. Um, now, um, what Paul and Erica and Han argued in this review, among other things, was that there's actually an incommensurability between scientific realism and anti-realism. They understood Kuhn and Feyerbin to be uh, anti-realists, or I think they said non-realists, and they took the idea of incommensurability to be tied up closely with this non-realist view. And so they then took me to be making assumptions of a realist nature, which I was then employing against the, these anti-realists. And so I was begging the question against the uh, Kuhn and, against Kuhn and Feyerbin. And so there was a kind of incommensurability at a meta level, a meta incommensurability. Um, now, connection between that and my current approach, well, We'll see in a bit that Roderick Chisholm, in his response to the skeptic, explicitly begs the question against the skeptic. And I think he rightly does so. I think it's completely legitimate to beg the question against the skeptic. So one thing I've come to is the idea that sometimes begging the question is all right, and begging the question is just part of deep disagreement. So while I initially thought that the charge of meta incommensurability uh, carried with it a kind of a serious um, objection of my having begged the question, I now think it's just part and parcel of debate that you disagree with each other at a quite fundamental level. You're going to have to beg the question, and some of the times it's fine to beg the question. Um, final connection is really around an implication of relativism. Um, if relativism is taken seriously, then there's really no point engaging in discussion with people with whom you profoundly disagree because you're basically both right. And there's no way you're going to persuade them. Um, and so from a, from the, if you think about relativism, there can't be any possibility of productive critical exchange of ideas. There can't be a real debate because people view, people's views are correct internal to their own positions. Well, this doesn't fit with the way my exchanges with Paul over the last so many years have gone. We disagree quite fundamentally, but I think it's fair to say we've both found this exchange productive. We've both clarified our views. We've sometimes adopted views that we didn't start with. Um, it's not obvious to me that the relativists can possibly explain well what goes on in these, dis these debates between people who don't share fundamental assumptions. Such debates can actually be fruitful. So in fact, I'm, I'm not really keen on Popper's discussion of relativism in his paper, The Myth of the Framework, but one thing he says about the relativist is conflicts between cultures can actually be fruitful. And what I found is in the, my engagement with Paul, my interaction with Paul, even though we disagree on everything except for the middle of the road issues, which we always agree on for some reason, um, it's actually a productive interaction. So that's the connection. Now here's the plan, and I hope I have time for it. Um, I am going to start by um, contrasting epistemic relativism with other kinds of relativism. I'm only talking about relativism, about justified belief and knowledge, and I'm not even thinking about the aspect of knowledge that involves truth. So this is relativism about epistemic justification. Um, I'll characterize that position, epistemic relativism, uh, and I'm going to contrast it with skepticism. But I actually think, and I have a kind of a unified approach to skepticism and relativism, I actually think that the fundamental argument for epistemic relativism comes out of the skeptical tradition. 
It's a skeptical argument. It's a skeptical argument in the sense that the skeptics proposed it. Uh, and they typically drew a skeptical conclusion from it. Um, and this argument is usually called the problem of the criterion. Sometimes it's called the dialelos. Sometimes it's presented as Agrippa's trilemma. Um, I'm going to look at Roger Chisholm's response to this skeptical argument. And then I'm going to present you with my response to epistemic relativism, which combines uh, Chisholm's particularist epistemology with um, a reliableist conception of epistemic warrant and um, a naturalistic epistemological outlook. Um, so I am talking about epistemic relativism. Whenever you hear people talk about relativism, I think it's worth asking what is meant. And you can be a relativist about a variety of different things. Um, so I'm not talking about relativism about truth. This is not, the view is not P could be true for these people and false for these people. That's not the claim that's under question. Um, not the, the question, but the issue that I'm looking at. I'm not looking at the issue of ontological relativism. Maybe that's what you get in Kuhn if you have phenomenal worlds. Um, not looking at the idea that the world is relative to our, uh, depends upon our beliefs or something like that. Um, and I'm not thinking about conceptual relativism, which for some people was what was on the agenda with issues of semantic incommensurability. Certainly Donald Davidson uh, took conceptual relativism to be something that Kuhn and Feyerman uh, were party to. But I'm not looking at those things. I'm looking at the idea of relativism with respect to um, epistemic justification. Now I actually think that you can get those kinds of relativism in Kuhn. And I wrote a paper on that years ago in which I outlined that. But that's not the topic. Um, the topic is relativism with respect to rational belief, justified belief, and so forth. Now, I'm going to typically use the word norm. Um, by epistemic norm, I'm thinking of a kind of a standard or a rule uh, that you appeal to when you're justifying a belief. Um, and what the epistemic relativist says is that epistemic norms are relative to context. Um, they uh, they're relative to context, they depend upon the context, they vary from one context to another. Um, epistemic norms are not something that are fixed, they're not universal, they're not absolute. Uh, there's no such thing as an objectively correct set of epistemic norms. There are just a variety of epistemic norms that um, are some, one set of norms is used in one context and another set of norms is, is, is employed in another. Um, and the claim of the epistemic relatives is that basically all epistemic norms have the same status. No epistemic norms are better, better warranted, provide a greater amount of justification than any others. Um, so what the relatives is going to claim is that um, there are uh, different kinds of contexts in which we find that different um, norms are employed. Uh, and um, where a belief is justified in one context based on a set of norms that are employed there, the belief will be justified in that context. And what this is going to entail is that there could actually be one belief that is justified for a group of people with one set of norms to accept, and the actual very opposite contradictory belief could be justified for another group of people using the norms that they accept. That's kind of the obvious implication of relativism. Another implication is that you could, in fact, have the same belief being endorsed on the basis of quite different epistemic norms. But I guess the, the sort of the case that people typically are going to focus on is the case where one and the same belief can be rationally held by different people and different epistemic communities working with different um, norms. Now, one little quick bit of uh, clarification. I like to use the word context. Um, I don't find it easy to not use the word context. But because I use the word context, there is a risk of some confusion. Um, in straight epistemology, there's a very active uh, uh, literature on contextualism and variety of kinds of relativism that have come out of reactions to contextualism. And what I'm talking about is not what's nowadays called contextualism or epistemological contextualism. Um, what the epistemological contextualist says 
is that epistemic words like the word no are context sensitive. Um, and so um, the, you can have one particular proposition which you can know in one context and the very same proposition you wouldn't know in another context because the, con the, the use of the word no is sensitive to the context. Um, typically, the examples you get are cases where um, there are higher or lower stakes. Uh, for example, um, one of the classic examples is uh, needing to deposit a check in the bank and wondering whether the bank is open or closed on Saturday morning. Uh, and if it's crucial to deposit the check, like you're going to lose your house on Monday if, the, if, the, if you try to deposit your check on Saturday and the, and the bank is, is closed. Well, in that case, the, st the stakes are quite high. And um, the inclination to say, well, in a particular way of describing it, you don't know. Um, whereas if, you, if it wasn't so urgent, it might be the case that you'd be prepared to say, I know that the bank's going to be open on Saturday morning. The thought is that the contextualists think that the word no is sensitive to uh, variation in uh, kind of what's at issue, what's at, what's at stake. And I don't think this is the kind of view that I'm talking about when I talk about epistemic relativism and when I talk about contexts. Um, often the contextualists are speaking about quite specific contexts of utterance, uh, not cultures, not paradigms, not theories, not time periods. They're talking about very specific linguistic context of assertion. And when the contextualists talk about standards differ, differing, they're typically talking about one standard being applied with more or less rigor, not completely different standards. The epistemic relativist is thinking about there being completely different standards being employed. So the Azandi uh, used the poison oracle to figure out certain things, and we don't use a poison oracle. The poison oracle is not something that we would take to justify any beliefs. Um, so that's really just to sort of say that I'm not talking about what's sometimes called contextualism. Um, now, part of my view that we have to talk about both relativism and skepticism. But I think it's crucial to think or not to think that relativism and skepticism are the same thing. And at least a couple of um, uh, uh, some sort of salient difference. Now, if you think of sort of a, the way we often think of skepticism nowadays, um, the skeptic denies that we have knowledge, or the skeptic denies that we have justified belief. Um, that might be a kind of a radical form of skepticism. A older form of skepticism, which I think is a more moderate form of skepticism, the Pironian skepticism of Sexus Empiricus and, and, the, and the people he was writing about, um, doesn't tell us that we don't have knowledge and justify belief. It tells us that we should suspend all belief. We should suspend judgment. We shouldn't have any beliefs. Um, both of those positions, the skeptical positions, are sort of getting us either to say that we don't have knowledge or justify belief or not to commit to any beliefs or, 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 or to our having any knowledge. That's not what the relativist says, as I understand the epistemic relativist. The epistemic relativist says that we do have knowledge and we do have justified belief. It just happens that the knowledge that we have or the justified belief we have is relative to the standard or norms that are operative in whatever context we occupy. Um, so I think of the relativist as actually being prepared to positively assert that we may have knowledge or justified belief, whereas the skeptic is going to do something like deny that. Um, okay, now I want to talk about the um, uh, philosophical um, problem that, or issue that I think is at the base of uh, relativism and that is in fact um, um, a problem that comes out of skeptical tr uh, tradition. I, I think we have to be very clear that the skeptic and relativist will say different things. Um, but um, there's an argument that I find lies behind much relativistic thinking. It's the argument that is known, I think probably most widely known, as the problem of the criterion. Um, I'll go introduce it first in a, in a form that's a little bit like what's also called Agrippa's trilemma. Um, and the basic thought is that this is an, an argument that shows that we can't be justified in any belief, and in particular, we can't be justified in employing any epistemic norm. Um, 
So here's, here's my way of setting up uh, Agrippa's trilemma. Um, when you read Sextus Empiricus, he uses the word criterion. And the criterion is something that you employ to work out whether you should accept a belief. I think he would often have talked about a criterion of truth. Um, I'm going to treat a criterion as roughly analogous to what I'm calling uh, an epistemic norm or a standard. Um, and so uh, what you should consider is we have some proposed criterion or norm. Maybe it's something simple like uh, we should believe of the dictates of our senses. Um, or maybe it's something complicated. Or maybe it's something that we wouldn't regard as being particularly uh, a good way of forming beliefs. The Azandi's use of the poison article to answer all sorts of practical questions. Now, how do you justify an epistemic norm? Think of the values that Martin Carrier was talking about. How can we justify an epistemic norm? Well, you might appeal to some other epistemic norm or some other criterion. But that just pushes the question back to that norm or criterion. How are we going to justify that other one? Well, we've got the beginnings of an infinite regress. If you have an infinite regress, you're not going to be justifying the norm that you were trying to justify in the first place. So maybe you can avoid the infinite regress. Uh, and maybe what you could do is, well, somehow go back and appeal to the original criterion or norm, right? Maybe you can appeal to the norm that you were originally trying to justify by appealing to itself. But if you've done that, you've argued in a circle. You wanted to prove that a norm was a good way of justifying a belief, and then you appeal to the norm itself. Well, if you needed to justify it, appealing to it itself wasn't going to justify it. So circularity isn't going to be a way of justifying a norm. The option appears to be that you don't appeal to a norm, and you just accept the norm. So that's the norm we're going to accept. But if you do that, you've adopted it dogmatically without providing any reason for it. And all three options uh, are options in which we fail to justify a criterion. And the thought is, it's not possible to provide a justification for any epistemic norm because of the threat of the infinite regress, circularity, or the option of adopting a norm without providing any justification for it. Now, the skeptic, the Pyrrhonian skeptic, suspends judgment. We have no basis to believe anything, and they just withhold belief altogether. But um, the relativist takes a different tack. The relativist says, OK, what's been shown is that it's not possible to provide any epistemic norm with a justification. All epistemic norms are therefore unjustified. And that means that no norm is any better justified than any other. And so all epistemic norms that are, may be proposed are on the same footing. They're absolutely equivalent as far as their justification is concerned. All right, the thought is no norm is justified. So they're all on the same status, on the same standing. They all have the same status. They are equally justified. That's the relativist appropriation of um, the skeptical problem of the criterion. And in one of the articles I wrote about this, I showed that uh, that argument is actually uh, fairly widespread in the history and philosophy of science. Um, and I've also tried to argue that it's the fundamental argument for relativism. But I can't really, I don't know how you show something at the most fundamental, so I strongly suggested it instead. Um, now I want to talk about Roderick Chisholm. And I want to talk about the view that I've taken over from Chisholm, uh, which is a response of his to um, the skeptic, to Peronian skepticism. This is in a very short book of his, uh, named The Problem of Criterion. Uh, and I'm incapable of reading long books. Um, so I only read short <laughs> books. And this is like 35 pages long, so I've read it many times. Um, um, now, uh, Chisholm poses the problem um, uh, that he's interested in, the, sort of the problem of knowledge, in terms of two pairs of epistemological questions. And he presents three possible responses to these uh, two questions. The responses he presents are skepticism, methodism, and particularism. So here are the two questions he looks at. Um, the first question is, what do we know? What is the extent of our knowledge? Right? What are the things that we know? What things do we know? The second pair of questions is, 
how do we decide whether we know? What are the criteria of knowledge? So two kinds of questions. What are the things we know, and how do we determine whether we actually know something? Um, he, he thinks these are kind of the two fundamental questions um, of epistemology, and they're effectively they're being raised by skeptical concerns. Um, now, there are, are three ways that Chisholm thinks that these two questions can be answered. The skeptic answers these questions, uh, or, or has a sort of a particular take on these two questions. Um, what the skeptic does, as Chisholm presents it, is look at the two questions and notice that they're connected, right? The question, um, what do we know, has a connection with the question of how are we able to decide? What criteria do we employ to decide what we know? There's a sense in which they presuppose each other. Um, if you um, are able to, if you have a criterion for knowledge, then you can tell whether you know something. If you knew something, you could tell whether the criterion was a criterion for knowledge. Um, but the skeptical thought is that um, you couldn't answer one without the other. You wouldn't be able to answer the question, what do we know, if you didn't know how to determine whether you knew something. But equally, you wouldn't be able to determine whether a criterion was capable of identifying items of knowledge unless you had an independent way of, of identifying something as knowledge. You can only tell the criterion is picking out knowledge if you know what knowledge is. So there's a thought that these two questions presuppose each other. And as Chisholm presents the skeptic, the skeptic says, well, since they presuppose each other and you can't answer one without the other, you can't answer either, right? So the thought is we don't know what we know and we're not able to tell in any particular case whether we in fact know anything. And this kind of way of putting these two questions and playing them off against each other is another version of the, of the problem of the criterion. It doesn't, it's not structured in the way that Agrippa's trilemma is, and that's why it's usually called the wheel or the dialelos. So that was the skeptical response. Basically, we can't know anything. Um, but Chisholm points out there's two other ways of going about it, and he uses the word methodism um, to describe the uh, second option, the second option to, to skepticism. Um, now, obviously, this isn't a religious view, but he takes the word methodism. Uh, and the reason he does is because he's thinking of methods for identifying knowledge. Um, and his thought is that, well, these two questions presuppose each other, but maybe you could answer one before the other. And the thought is um, that uh, there are going to be some philosophers who think that what we could do is answer the question of the criteria for knowledge before we answer the question of what it is that we know. Um, and these are the people he calls the Methodists, the Methodists, and he gives Locke and Hume as examples of Methodists. Uh, they basically embrace an empiricist criterion of knowledge and then to effectively just take the consequences uh, that we don't have much knowledge. The thought is we define or accept or endorse a criterion and then we apply it and we use the criterion to work out what we know, but we adopt the criterion first. Um, and Chisholm rejects Methodism. He thinks it's just going to be arbitrary because if you just plump for a criterion, you just choose a criterion, you've got no basis on which to choose it, so you've got no reason to adopt one criterion as opposed to another. Um, so he rejects um, the Methodist approach as mistaken because it's just arbitrary. What he thinks is that we should answer the first question the question of what we know first. And this is the position that he calls the particularist view. Um, and the, the idea is you start with what you know. You start with identification of those items of knowledge that we have, and you subsequently ask the question of how we came to have that knowledge. He thinks this is the most reasonable response, uh, and basically his thought would be there's a great deal that we actually quite obviously do in an uncontroversial way know. And what we should do is start with these things that we know. And only after we've identified items of knowledge should we then turn to the question of the criteria of knowledge. Um, his, he has a couple of examples. One example is Thomas Reed, but one of his clear examples of particularism is G.E. Moore. And Moore uh, holds up one hand and says, I know that here's a hand. And um, 
uh, Chisholm's idea is, well, that's an example of a particular item of knowledge, a particular case of knowledge that we possess. Um, seems fairly uncontroversial, uh, and we just start with these particular cases of knowledge. What we then do is we inspect these cases of knowledge. And on the basis of inspecting these cases of knowledge, we then develop epistemic criteria. We start with cases of knowledge. We do some epistemology second. We develop our criteria by considering the cases of knowledge. So if this is the right approach, then what you do is you start with the first question, what do you know? And then you move on to the second question, what are the criteria of knowledge? Well, um, there is a problem with the particularist response. Um, if you merely start with items of knowledge, well, um, in a sense, that was what the skeptic was challenging, right? Um, if you start by saying, here are some uncontroversial items of knowledge, and then we'll answer epistemological questions, it looks like you're just begging the question against the skeptic. Um, and Chisholm's thought is, that's right. Uh, what few philosophers had the, the courage to recognize is this. We can deal with the problem only by begging the question. It seems to me that if we do recognize the fact, as we should, then it's unseemly for us to pretend that it isn't so. Um, and um, that's something that I propose to take on board. Now, um, I'm really going to just give you a sketch of the position that I um, have been developing the last few years, um, um, which is an attempt to respond to epistemic uh, relativism by drawing on Chisholm's uh, epistemic particularism. Um, what I suggest is that we can follow Chisholm in his response to the problem of the criterion, so we can follow him in his a suggestion that what we should do is start with particular items of knowledge. We start by identifying uncontroversial epistemic claims, things that we claim to know, items of knowledge, uh, and then we move on from there. Where I differ from Chisholm, uh, Chisholm was, his sort of epistemological position was in a sense pre Quinean and so forth. Um, I combine the particularist position with um, a naturalistic approach to epistemological questions, uh, and among other things, to uh, a naturalistic approach to skepticism and the nature of epistemic justification. And basically, this involves two things. First, we actually know a great deal. We possess a lot of knowledge. In fact, I think knowledge is really easy. We have a lot of knowledge. It would be boring for me to tell you how much I can know about what's the content of this room. We know a great deal. Um, and not only that, but we can use what we know in order to evaluate various epistemic norms. So we propose criteria, we propose norms um, that we're going to use to justify our beliefs, and we can use the knowledge that we have in order to justify, evaluate, assess those norms. Um, now, uh, As a naturalist, I want to say that the skeptic is just wrong, right? The skeptic commits a basic error. The basic error is that the skeptic erects some inappropriately high, in excessively rigorous standards for knowledge that just aren't the standards of knowledge. They're not our standards. Uh, they're just not even, they're not even the kind of standards we should take seriously. And so I think the skeptic is just wrong. Um, now, that means that I think that the skeptic is mistaken. Um, and um, so um, what I want to do is reject skepticism and follow Chisholm, Chisholm's particularism, by saying that we're able to identify a lot of specific cases uh, where we know something. Now, Chisholm, as we've just seen, thinks we just have to go ahead and beg the question against the skeptic. The epistemic particularist says that we know a lot of things, moves on to epistemic criteria subsequently. Chisholm thinks we just have to be honest about this. Um, we're begging the question. Now, as a naturalist, 
There's a sense in which I think I must beg the question against the, the skeptic, but I think the skeptic is just wrong, right? The skeptic is wrong in challenging the idea that we have any knowledge whatsoever. Um, if that is something where I must beg the question, I'm prepared to accept that I'm begging the question, but I think I'm right to beg the question against the skeptic because I think the skeptic is just wrong. Um, now, how are we going to conduct an appraisal of various um, epistemic norms or standards or values that might be proposed? Um, I see a connection between Chisholm's particularism and naturalism. Um, the rough thought is that um, uh, there's a lot that we know, and what we need to do is, for any proposed epistemic norm, we need to evaluate it. We need to work out whether it actually leads to knowledge. Um, and what you're, you're able to do that because we actually do have knowledge. We're able to test some norm, we're able to test some standard procedure, and determine whether what it picks out actually is knowledge. We can do that because, as a particularist, I think we actually do know things. And what I want to suggest that we do um, is that we try to work out whether an epistemic norm actually reliably produces knowledge or truth. Um, and the thought is that uh, where there's an epistemic norm that is more reliable than another epistemic norm, um, then that norm is more justified and provides greater justification than the other. And the simple thought is that there are some epistemic norms that have a greater degree of justification than others. And they do that because they are more highly reliable in leading to the truth or knowledge than others. Um, so I, on the basis of this view, I can simply reject the epistemic relativistic, uh, relativist position uh, pretty quickly. Because as we've seen, the epistemic relativist view is that all norms have equal standing, and I simply don't think we need to buy that. Um, some epistemic norms have greater justification than others because they are more reliable in producing knowledge or leading to the truth than others. Uh, so it's simply not the case that all epistemic norms have the same standing. Um, and so um, let me just summarize my position. Um, uh, I claim that the old problem of the infinite regress and circularity of justifying criteria, otherwise known as the problem of the criterion, is actually the basis for epistemic relativism. Um, the relativist holds the view that all norms are equally justified. Um, Schism appeals to what he calls particularism to respond to the problem of the criterion. I think we can, can combine Chisholm's particularism with a naturalistic, reliableist conception of justification. Uh, I think on that basis we can say that some norms are more reliable than others, uh, and so the epistemic relativist claim that all epistemic norms have equal standing is just false. First among, first among equals. <laughs>
so I, so, I, so, I, 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 so I, I suspect that what the skeptic, so I, I want to say that the skeptic and the relativist disagree on one thing. The skeptic denies knowledge, the relativist says that we have knowledge, but they seem to me to agree in rejecting objective knowledge. So that, that seems to be something that they agree to. I, I think of the relativist as kind of being a bystander and a, an onlooker, uh, observing that there are different communities in which different claims are being asserted. Um, and the relativist is going to say, you know, fundamentally, the standards that are being appealed to aren't justified, um, but uh, standards employed in that community are just as good as the standards employed there. And internal to the community, they're justifying themselves. And I think you're right that the relativist is saying there's knowledge, but it's not a kind of a, a, a genuinely substantive conception of knowledge that they're, that they're, that they're claiming. Yeah. <coughs> Don't go too fast. Why, why should the skeptic believe your argument, basically? I mean, right. your, for me, the argument seems to be that yeah. you say with your convincing voice, yeah. I know that I have knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> so, the first question. can I answer the first one first? Yeah. I don't think it's a standard that I really have to be judged by if I can't persuade a skeptic. I, I, think, I think there's a mistake if we think that in order to provide a convincing in this logical position, we actually have to be able to persuade some particular person that they're wrong. So, uh, I, if I stand up here and say I have knowledge, and I'm going to say something like, it, it's far more plausible to say that here's one hand than that there isn't, that might not persuade the skeptic. But it's not obvious to me that persuading the skeptic is a standard that I need to sort of hold myself up to. Okay. Then the second question would be, you say some norms are more reliable than others, so yep. not all epistemic norms have the same epistemic standards, right? Yes, that's what I want to say. That, I mean, the relatives, as I understand it, will say that they all have the same status. Okay, but this implies kind of, or might imply kind of a mild relativism, right? So they are like, there might even be like seven. So my so mate Hassock right? is a pluralist, and right. so am I. <laughs> I'm an epistemic pluralist. Okay, uh, and so it, but, okay. but, but what I mean is, there can be more than one epistemic norm that is, in a sense, objectively correct. That, that I don't mean, sorry, that may sound like, what I'm saying is <laughs> there can be different norms that lead reliably to the truth. And truth is being understood in an objective sense. There will be a, some norms that don't lead to the truth. And so they'll be unreliable and we'll reject them. But I, I allow that there can be multiple norms. So in a sense, uh, I'm going to, you might want to call it relativism. It's going to be, this is in a sense, a lesson that I get from Kuhn, that there can be rational disagreement. There can be rational disagreement between people who are appealing to perfectly genuine epistemic considerations. Now, it's not relativism because I'm not saying all norms have the same status. To me, that would be the relativist view. So the Azandi have their poison oracle, uh, we have some other criterion, and they're just as justified as we are. So I, 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 think it's, I think it's actually really an important thing to be distinguishing relativism from pluralism. Thank you. So one last question by Tarsten Wilhite. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm not a relativist uh, of either uh, persuasion, and so I would like, to, like a solution to the problem of the criterion. I just can't believe that it could be quite that easy. And, um, well, I've written 10 papers about it, and believe me. Uh, OK, it. OK. <laughs> um, so it seems to me that, this, that the particularist position seems very convincing uh, when applied to certain kinds of examples, the Murian kinds of examples, yeah. where you say, well, OK, what could be more certain than that there's a hand here? Absolutely. And so and how good can a, any philosophical uh, premise be to convince me that it isn't, so uh, the hand wins, so to say. Yeah. And there's thousands of similar examples. Yes, OK. Huge but that's, body of uncontroversial Yes, so that's, where, that's where it becomes tricky, because in order to get a full-fledged solution to the problem of the criteria, you would need to systematically assess the reliability of methods. Yep. On, and, and, and wouldn't that 
uh, mean that we would have this immediate kind of uh, uh, access to judge whether we have knowledge or not for well, basically over the full range yeah. Yeah. Of, uh, of our possible uh, beliefs. And uh, so we would have to know knowledge when we see it. Yeah. So, so I know knowledge when yeah. I see it. So, and so that's I, I, a good far question. less um, convincing. And so this position is not just an epistemic particulars position. It's actually an application of Loudon's normative naturalism mm -hmm. uh, that I'm applying in a much more general way. Um, and the idea is that there um, are epistemic norms, and some are going to be quite sophisticated. For example, the, the rules of scientific methodology. Um, and we don't have immediate access to knowledge in that area. Um, but we're just going to have to build up. There are going to be some basic norms that we work with. And then there are going to be some others that we have to actually establish in the way I've sketched. And then some of those norms are now going to, be have, going to have to be applied to some other places, right? So for example, um, I think we can do a lot of work with the Morian stuff. But I'm not going to be able to give you a story about the acceptance of scientific theories based on Morian considerations. I'll use Morian considerations as a way of providing the warrant for the epistemic norms, which are then used to evaluate scientific theories. Right? Is that making enough sense to you? Yeah, so, yeah. It's, so, it's, it's, so the thought is, yeah. there's actually a bit of bootstrapping that's going to go on. I, we use uncontroversial items of ordinary knowledge to establish their epistemic criteria. Now we use the epistemic criteria with respect to the controversial items that's where, we're, that's where we now have the rules of scientific method, which are being used to evaluate competing scientific theories. That's the exception. Okay. So actually, we do have time for one other question. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank I'm you very much. Briefly. So in in Taiwan, Taiwan, the moderator was trying to get us to behave, and I said, "Don't worry, this is the Paul and Howard show." Yeah, and, and I've got a new move to that. Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that you've got so many examples of, uh, of uh, truths uh, like the two hands and so on and so forth. The point simply is there are a few examples and they are of historically utmost importance and they change the picture completely. And I give you one example and don't answer by giving me 999 others because that's the example that's historically the one. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't put on the Paul Howard show, or the Howard Paul show. No, look there to the sun, okay? Now you say the sun shines and the sun is moving. Isn't that absolutely uncontroversial? I paper about that. <laughs> Unfortunately, only until Copernicus. Because the point is what people learned really from Copernicus is that some of the features you see may be purely object-sided, yep. but there may be other features no, 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 that are no, no. also maybe a, Yeah, the movement of the sun is some of that. And if you look historically, this was the beginning, at least in my view, that uh, that was uh, the precursor of the difference between primary and secondary qualities, yep. and that made modern science possible. So your position is not what some people say, well, I don't mind pre-Kantian positions as long as they are formulated before Kant. That's one of the, the, the uh, slogans, right? But the point is it's much worse. You stick to a sort of Aristotelianism and never make the move that was so important for Western culture through the Copernican Revolution, because you can't move, make it. So that's another paper. OK. <laughs> Science, content, and reality is the name of yeah. another paper. Um, uh, and basically, my line on the sun is that before and after the scientific revolution, uh, it still looks exactly the same. Yeah. Um, and that's common sense. Um, so what we've done is we've, 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 we've found out that a kind of earlier explanation Actually, what you said about the primary second, this is, so years ago, I was accusing Paul of basically being a skeptic. Um, uh, and I thought that's what lay behind the, uh, the Kantian thing. And when he talks, I think this is right, for you it's the primary secondary quality distinction that was important. Is that right? Because that's what you said. When I, when I was saying it's basically a skepticism that lies behind your neo-Kantian view, 
you began to talk about primary secondary quality distinction. You said, I don't think there are any primary qualities or something like that. So that, that was where I found that my diagnosis of your view as being skeptical actually was wrong, and you had another kind of conception of, of that was leading you to the neo Kantian view. Yeah. Okay. So, as Thank a, you. Oh, yeah.